Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Da, 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 da. It's the podcast starting. The podcast is starting. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Command Zone. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. The podcast has begun. That I don't know why, but I... I got the final countdown stuck in my head just now. It just reminds me of Arrested Development. Because it was like the countdown to the start. It's the final countdown. Yep. It's so that epic happens. song. <laughs> that's, yeah. And again, that's that's the episode. That's, that's just how it. my brain works. Just for no reason, that song said, jump in there. It's a good song. Mm-hmm. Every time I listen to it, it's the perfect mix of super cheesy, and it actually gets you going. It gets you going. Maybe we you know, should listen to that before we do our workouts. <laughs> That's oh, the one. yeah, we'll have to touch on that later. Yeah. Um, but but it's a sad day, do you mean? It is a sad day. It's a sad, sad day. It's Tuesday. <laughs> it's <Wait>. not. <laughs> Are we in the future or the past? Because it's not actually Tuesday It's not right actually now. Tuesday, yeah. Uh, I would say the future. Uh, it is a sad day because our editor, Eli Cuevas, is moving on. He has graduated... Or something, and yeah, he went infinite, and he he's went done infinite. with Commander. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Eli, who also works uh, at and for Rocket Jump, has just been super busy doing all the cool stuff that Rocket Jump's doing, including Rocket yep. Jump the Show, which you should check out on Hulu. Um, so Eli's just hasn't had the amount of time uh, to do the show. I mean, he's still been doing it, but it's just like we get now the. I mean, it's a time I don't crunch. know about last time, like 4 a.m. was when I got the thing from him, uh, the the like final audio for me to check. Yeah. So that was like, oh, man. So Eli's done such a great job. I edited the show until episode 10. And then except for maybe once or twice, Eli has edited every episode since then. So yep. something like 70 episodes of the show. Back in the early days, he said he would cut out all the uh, silences between the uh, we would talk. <laughs> Uh, and then keep going, and he would cut all those out. And yeah, that stopped a while ago. That's, yeah, fortunately, we've just, instead of actually saying, um, we just roll over with words that don't make sense sometimes. We just talk <laughs> through it. <laughs> well, and the big thing is the video, too. That takes a lot of time. If you haven't checked out uh, the video on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash... The Command Zone Podcast. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> and um, like I'm like, what is... Oh, crap. Oh, crap. Um, and you can see like every card is shown. There's an animated background. Yeah. Uh, we've got nice text graphics. You know, if we're talking about something else, he might put a photo up. Like there's a, and the episodes are an hour plus. So that's just a ton of work that Eli's been doing um, twice a week. Yeah. For a while there. So, Eli, we're going to miss you, pal. Miss um, you. I'm sure that the listeners will miss you and the watchers. And, uh, but we have a new guy. Woohoo! So, starting with this episode, we have Terry. Hey, so instead of, hey, Eli, you need to cut that out. We're going to say, hey, Terry. Hey, Terry. So, hey, Terry, welcome aboard. Good welcome luck. Welcome aboard. Good. We're all counting on you. Yeah, we're going to say some really weird names in this episode, and uh, we're not going to tell you what they are. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, if if we screw up, like, a, a rules uh, interaction or something, Terry, I, f- I expect you to fix that. That's right. Terry, uh, what, what pharmacist does Terry play? I don't know. He wasn't familiar with Commander, but he does play Magic. So. Well, yeah, no one's familiar with Commander until you really dive in, right? But he's Terry's in Indiana right now, but he's actually moving out to L.A. in like uh, three or four weeks. Oh, so perfect. don't worry. We'll get him into Commander. Excellent. But he does know Magic, um, so he, he is familiar with a lot of the cards. Yeah. Um, so that'll help. Not uh, many editing positions have the uh, tagline of, you must know how to play Magic the Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah. So... Now, that was the sad part. Now we have the happy part. The happy part is we have a contest, and oh my gosh, we had a ton of new submissions this week. It was we, awesome. There was a lot of names I didn't recognize. Yeah. Um, there and was a lot just of people, a whole bunch of submissions in total. And people saying, like, this is the first time I've submitted to a contest. Like, this is the first contest since I started listening to the show, which makes me super happy. Yeah, it also means we haven't had a contest in a while. <laughs> um, so this is awesome. We're going to announce the winners near the end of the show. Yep. Um, so if you tweeted at us, emailed us, we even took the submissions off the YouTube comments and such, you will have a chance to win. Yeah. But you'll have to listen till the end or skip ahead now and check and see if you won and then but, come back. But don't, because today's main topic is a fun one. We are talking about Metamai the Ageless and the deck that the Community Cup made, or the community made during the Community Cup this year. 
Uh, and and the, by community, Jimmy means him. Yeah, me, uh, Yoel Larson, and Wedge from the Manasaurus teamed up to make a commander deck uh, for the first time ever at the Community Cup. So we're going to deck tech that and talk about how to build with flavor, I guess, a little bit. And also, like, how we were terrified to put in, like, we did, did not put in Path to the Exile in that deck. <laughs> yeah, because you had to be on flavor. So yeah. that was the biggest part. The way the scoring worked was there was 15 points available, five points from three different judges. Yep that would judge you on flavor. And then the match itself when you played the game was what? You could only... Three points. Three points if you win the match. Yeah, so it was very important to get the flavor right. But, uh, of course, we wanted to make the deck at least be able to win the match as well. And that we did, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But Well, uh, well the great thing about this and the unique thing for the first time ever on the Command Zone, we're going to deck tech a deck... And you can actually go and watch the video of it being played. Yeah, that's actually really cool. Yeah, so that's never happened before. So we'll give you all that information in the show notes. We'll probably announce it here after we talk about it, uh, just so you can go find it. And the game was pretty awesome. And you can also, yeah. after that match, you can hear Jimmy pontificate about it for about 20 minutes to the <laughs> judges, which is also a fun part of the watch. Yeah, far too long. Uh, <laughs> no, it worked. It yeah, worked. it worked. Yeah, it was a good strategy. I, it was on flavor, right? Yeah. I was taking extra turns and des <laughs> describing what the deck was all about. Um, so at the Community Cup this year, they had Iron Root Chef, which is a mainstay of the Community Cup, which is a competition that is uh, also run by Nate Holt over Twitter. Very often he announces the new people that are going to be in it. And it's about building t a flavorful deck against another flavorful deck. And it's all about the flavor. It's not about making a competitive, like, strong deck or whatever. It's about making the most flavorful deck based on a key ingredient. So it's like, uh, uh, it's like Iron, Iron Chef. Chef. Yeah. Yep. But Iron Root, because Iron Root, whatever that... Iron Root uh, Tree Folk. Tree Folk, yeah. was one of those original cards back in the day. Um, so at the Community Cup this year, we were given a key ingredient to a deck, and we had to build around that. And so in this case, they offered up five yep. different commanders that we could build from. And they were Kervek the Merciless, uh, Metamai the Ageless, Radha, heir to Keld, Ramirez de Pietro, and Safi Eriksdotter. So just for fun, let's read these, uh, the five choices, just so people who aren't familiar know what each yeah, one was. So Kervek the Mer Merciless is five and Rakdos, so five of black and a red. For a 5-4 legendary creature, human shaman, Kervek says, whenever an opponent casts a spell, Kervek deals damage to target creature or player equal to that spell's converted mana cost. Whoa. So he was one of the choices. Yeah, and then uh, we won't talk about Metamai right now, but we had Radha, heir to Keld. Uh, she is a legendary creature elf warrior 2-2 two, two, that costs Gruul, so red and green. Whenever Radha, heir to Keld, attacks, you may add red, red to your mana pool, and you can also tap her to add green to your mana pool. So she's like a supreme mana dork. When, whenever she taps, she's going to add mana. The third choice was Safi, Eric's daughter. Safi costs just two mana. Uh, Celestia. Is that Celestia? Yes, a green and a white. Yeah. So Safi's a two mana two two. She's a bear. Legendary creature, human scout. You can sacrifice Safi and then. Let me read the oracle. That's weird, worded weird. Okay. Sacrifice Safi when target creature is put into your graveyard from the battlefield this turn. Return that card to the battlefield. So if when your creature is about to die, you can basically make Safi die instead of it. Yep. But it also does go to the graveyard and come back, so it'll double up uh, enter the battlefield effects and whatnot. Cool yeah, card. very and cool. We haven't talked about Safi a lot, but I have her in a lot of decks, and she's very useful in the 99. Yeah, and she she's essentially saving someone. She's right. sacrificing herself. Uh, and then there is Ramirez de Pietro, who is a very flamboyant pirate. He uh, costs three blue, black, black, so six total for a legendary creature human pirate, and he has first strike as a 4-3. So as, if you listened to last week, you'll know that this is the commander that the Wizards team chose. Correct. You guys actually got to choose first. Yeah, and everyone was thinking, you guys should totally take Ramirez de Pietro. Like, look at the flavor. It's a pirate. It's a flamboyant pirate. That, and it's like, it's it's oozing with flavor. And it's we just decided easy not flavor. To. Yeah, it's yeah, easy. We talked about this before. To me, it's if you look at a card and immediately know what you're supposed to do, then that's a, inherently easier yeah. than a card like all the rest of them where you're like you have to think about it for a second and be like, what do I do with that? Yeah, also the colors weren't that good for us. We wanted to one of the original ideas when we were like we should take uh, Ramirez was we need to do the princess bride story. Right. And uh, unfortunately blue and black doesn't really lend itself to having princesses or You need you white know. in there somewhere. Yeah, you need white in there and some other stuff. So we decided to go with Metamai, uh, which was Yoel Larson's first pick. Uh, uh, Pro Tour champion, Yoel Larson, we should clarify. Uh, Red Deck wins, by the way. He played Mono Red all the way. So, you go, bro. Um, so, 
That's why we didn't take Ramirez first, and we took Metamai the Ageless, and I'll read it now. It's four blue white for a 4-4 four, four legendary creature Sphinx flying. Whenever Metamai the Ageless deals combat damage to a player, take an extra turn after this one. Metamai the Ageless can't attack during extra turns. So uh, clearly the power level is up there. You get extra turns. Um, Very Extra high. turn shenanigans. Um, so we chose Metamai because we thought that the flavor... It was complicated, right? It could we it, it, at first glance it was like that thing. It was like, oh yeah, just make an extra turns deck. But the reason that we chose to to take Metamize because it was the challenge of building a deck that wasn't just about extra turns and where the extra flavor lied lay beyond that. Right. Um, so this we haven't really done a flavor deck on the show before, so this is going to be really interesting and cool to go through and just keep in mind as we're talking about cards. The goal of this deck is not to create the most powerful deck or to yeah you know the goal of this deck is to make sure that every card within it is on flavor is on theme has to do with metamai and you know that's why we were talking earlier and you couldn't put path to exile in this deck yeah although you totally would in a normal deck you would put soul ring and gilded lotus and all those cards in there but we did not put any of those in this deck because every single card needed to be specifically flavorful to metamai um, and, and, and what a fun and awesome way to build a deck. One we ha- again we haven't talked about much, but I would I would encourage people out there to give it a shot. I mean, even if you're mm-hmm. spiky or whatever, it can be fun to have one deck or a couple decks within your repertoire that are just for flavor. It's just yeah. like that just make people laugh. You know, when we had BDM on, he talked about a deck that was all had to do with crime, you know, syndicates or whatever. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. it was like murder, and it was like you know, every card in there. And and that can be a really cool deck, especially if you pull it out, start playing with it and don't say anything and mm-hmm. somebody else notices. So also you get flavor wins and those are by far one of the, some of the most satisfying wins you can get, uh, which is great because there were a couple of points when we played, when you all played the deck against Robert Schuster on the wizard side that everyone was like, whoa, that that's really flavorful and <laughs> very powerful. That's the nice thing is when you get to combine flavor and power. Um, and that's what we were aiming to do with this deck specifically. Um, so... This deck is also slightly edged to be better for 1v1, and that was kind of a spiky choice on our end because we wanted to get those extra three points. Yeah, it's smart. Um, and it's pretty crazy. We only had an hour to build it, and Metal Mai has a story behind him. So very quickly, uh, Metal Mai is from Theros Block, and he is a um, an oracle, an ageless oracle that comes to the citizens of Miletus uh, at times of sort of great historical events. So either like great religious ceremonies or right before the, the the beginning of a war, sort of stuff like that, he'll come and prophesy some stuff. Um, he speaks in riddles, he gives choices, and he's a prophet that can control time. So we definitely started with this, and that's where we went for it. We just were like, let's tell this story, and let's make sure every card that we that we choose highlights one of these sort of four aspects of Metamai. Mm-hmm. Um, Which is, it's also interesting to note, or I guess important to note, that he's a Greek Sphinx, yeah, which is not the exact same thing as an Egyptian Sphinx. <laughs> yes. Even though Yol Larson was dressed as an Egyptian, but there was some cards where I was surprised they weren't in there. But then when I learned, oh, he's a Greek Sphinx, well, you can't put in some of the things. So yeah, exactly. That that makes sense too. The first category. This is the most obvious one. Mastering time. Yeah. Mastering time. It's uh. Would you say he's like the master of the universe? He, he is a master of the universe indeed. Uh, we put So uh, we didn't want to make the entire deck about extra turns because that would just be, you know, it's part of his flavor, but that's not what he's all about. But, but it would be weird to have none. Yeah, exactly. It would be weird to have none. So we chose to put in cards like Temporal Manipulation. And it was really important that the name, either the name or the flavor text, was really flavorful to the uh, commander. Mm-hmm. So Temporal Manipulation is exactly what Metamai kind of has power over. And it's basically just three blue sorcery take an extra turn after this one. Um, and I love the flavor text. Doing something at the last minute isn't so bad when you can make that minute last, <laughs> which is great. Um, and all these, I mean, we don't have to read each one, but Time Warp, Temporal Mastery, that's mm-hmm. one of the newer ones. Uh, that's the Delve one, right? Yes. Time Stretch. They all just give extra turns. Some give two extra turns. Um, this last one's interesting because it's not actually a spell that does it. Oh, no, Temporal Mastery isn't the new one, actually. I'm sorry. It's the Miracle one. Oh, that's the Miracle one. Yes, I'm yeah. thinking of temporal distortion it's temporal something extortion no temporal temporal distortion? extortion is temporal a great name cascade, for a card temporal though. aperture temporal manipulation temporal isolation temporal mastery which there's, one which one has delve of, on it there's a lot of temporal <laughs> everything's it's, temporal at least it's not temperamental yeah that's right my internet is temporal trespass 
Temporal Trespass, right. Yeah, so Temporal Trespass we didn't put in because it has Liliana on the art. Oh, yeah, which doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, and the delve mechanic is cool, but, like, we wanted to make sure, like, if we did that, we definitely would have call gotten called out on it. Yeah, because delve has nothing to do with what he's doing either. Yeah, so. it's more of a, it's not really, yeah. So we didn't put Temporal Trespass in. Okay, or, well, let's talk about this last one, though. Lighthouse oh, yes. Chronologist. Lighthouse Chronologist. Because I'm, I'm curious how that fits into the flavor. Well, so one of the big things that we wanted to make sure that we highlighted was that it Benamai isn't just by himself. There are people on the ground that need to like interpret his riddles or be sort of the same in the universe of being able oh, to take, take extra turns. And Lighthouse Chronologist was a creature that um, was someone like if you look at the art, he's looking out, you know, at the lighthouse. He's sort of like someone that is waiting to see a sign, kind of he's able to the interpret signs. the signs. Yeah. Gotcha. So as someone in a lighthouse, we thought that was really matching sort of what Metamai did. All right, um, I buy it. Also, the cards are really good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we, I, we knew that part. <laughs> yeah, we also had um, uh, Time Stretch in there, and I believe... No, not Time Stretch. I'm sorry. We had a, a Time Reversal, and that's in the next section, which is messing with time. So Metamai not only is able to take extra turns, we want to do stuff that kind of changed the the way the, the game... The rules went. of the game, yeah, yeah. I like this section a lot. Yeah, th this is definitely what made the game so crazy when we played it. Um, time Reversal, if you guys watch our videos, this is the first animation that pops up by Jeffrey Palmer, um, is a uh, three blue-blue sorcery. Each player shuffles his or her hand and graveyard into his or her library, then draws seven cards, exile Time Reversal. It's um, it's time... What's the, what's the Power 9 card that this is the equivalent of? Just cost more. It's not Time Walk. Time Twister. Time Twister, yeah. yes. Uh, so it's basically a fair version of Time Twister. Yeah, and there, this kind of card has been printed actually a couple of times before. The art is so great on this. It's like a single dude in the middle of the universe, um, and he's conquering the master time. of the universe. Master of the That's universe. What I'm saying That's, That's Metamai. Him. Metamai is the master of the universe. Yeah, very cool card, right on flavor. The next one caused a lot of craziness in the game you guys played. It's called oh, yeah. Sands of Time. Sands of Time is a four-drop artifact. It says each player skips his or her untap step. So you don't get an unstep step. That's like stasis. Mm -hmm. But then it says, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player simultaneously untaps each tapped artifact, creature, and land he or she controls, and then taps each untapped artifact, creature, and land he or she controls. So on your untap step, if stuff's tapped, it untaps. But if it's untapped, it taps. Right. So you're kind of incentivized to tap out mm -hmm. so that it will untap. Now, back in the day, there was mana burn. So if you... Like, yeah. we're like, oh, I'm going to trick this and tap all my mana in response to this trigger, and then it'll untap all my lands. You that mana that. would hurt you. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> but it isn't always easy to tap your creatures. Right. So, some, I mean, most of the time to tap the creatures, you have to attack. And sometimes you don't want to because they'll block. Yep. So it can get you in sort of weird binds where like, well, I didn't want to attack. So that just tapped him basically until next turn. Yeah. And one of the, again, one of the big things we liked was giving the opponent the illusion of choice. Right. Uh, and, and yourself, too. So it's like, if you want to untap your creatures, they will have to swing. But that's a choice you have to make. And is it the right choice? Who knows? Uh, Sands of Time, I don't think we actually fully thought out how crazy this was going to make the game. Because when it hit the board, um, it was actually stolen by the pirate deck. Very flavorful. It took right. the Sands of Time. Because also, uh, Ramirez de Pietro is like ageless as well. You don't know his age. So having the so Sands of, of Time. Of course, he's stealing something that screws with time, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but that caused a lot of mayhem. And it was great because it, it totally is what we wanted to make the flavor of the deck was. Which was mess with the rules of the game. Untap steps now become this crazy weird thing that don't exist anymore. And everyone has to like switch what's tapped and untapped um and it also i, I have this in my chaos deck we've played oh it a really few times oh our, geez thank yeah. god i've never seen this on the table i would i would be a little it just gets confusing because everyone's like wait what do i have to do and you're like just everything that's right now tapped untap it and yeah didn't do flip the it around yeah um we also had time stop which is just says end the turn <laughs> as an instant which is great and that's it's actually a really powerful effect yeah right it's exactly what what metamai would want to do which is just be like stop everything now i have the power to just say no he does the uh, Professor X thing. Yeah. Everything goes... And then you go to the next turn. Oh, here's another temporal card. Temporal Distortion. Oh, yeah. It's a three and two blue for an enchantment. Whenever a creature or land becomes tapped, you put an hourglass counter on it. And then each permanent that has an hourglass counter on it doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, remove all hourglass counters from permanents that player controls. So what happens is basically your stuff untaps every other turn yeah and you you choose if you wanted to untap um right. that card is brutal actually it's a weird stasis I have it in effect. my stasis deck yeah. yeah 
it's uh it certainly slows down the game. You guys yeah. didn't get it out in your game, so no, we didn't. But we did get Paradox Haze out, which is oh, this card's actually awesome. Yeah, two in the blue enchantment or enchant player at the beginning of enchant player's first upkeep each turn. That player gets an additional upkeep step after this turn. So this is really messing with time because we also had cards with suspend in here and suspend is a mechanic that when you cast it, you put like time counters on it, and every time you have an upkeep, you remove a counter from it. So this lets you remove things twice as many times. It also, if you have like two expensive instants in your hand, lets you cast both of them because you get a. Uh, well, actually, with Sands of with Time, Sands it does. Of time. Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> what happens with Sands of Time is you get to untap on both upkeeps, so it actually gives you two untap steps. Without Sands of Time, it wouldn't do that. But uh, Paradox Haze wouldn't do that. But with Sands of Time, very, very... That's a, that's very a potent powerful. combo, and the great thing about it is it doesn't matter whose Sands of Time it is. Yeah, you're getting it So anyway. when they stole Sands of Time from you, it still worked with the Paradox Haze out, which basically meant two untap steps. Yeah. Uh, only to cast instance though it doesn't work or or instant speed stuff it doesn't work for sorcery speed stuff because you're still in your upkeep step yeah um paradox haze is very powerful we talked about it for the joy deck any deck that's doing stuff during its upkeep paradox haze is great yeah you want having double upkeep was really cool uh just watching some of the stuff that happened but it also uh, as you guys will see when we talk about the match more drain the clock a ton um next uh category we have is called speaking in riddles so you know as any kind of sage or you know person that comes to be an oracle for people they don't nec- they don't just come and be like this is going to happen this is what you need to do uh in greek mythology a lot of it is about you know delivering the message but that's kind of veiled and you have to figure out what the exact meaning is and what you right. get from it so we had a few cards in here that specifically dealt with that um omen speaker was one it's a just a it's a two drop that comes in and scries two immediately but it's from theros block um and we thought you know we wanted to make sure that we had actual theros cards in here because the flavor is just everywhere in these cards and the art and the in the text right. in- the omen speaker makes sense though because that's probably somebody who would hear one of metamized riddles and be like i've solved it this is what it is yeah and the you know the idea of scrying too is exactly what you want to be doing. Um, that card I bet was busted and limited. That card's sweet. It was good. It wasn't busted, but it was scry two is pretty good. Yeah, it was it was a strong card. I, I don't think it was a first pick or anything. Yeah. Um, the next one is Seagate Oracle. This card's amazing. Two in a blue for a one three wizard. When Seagate Oracle enters the battlefield, look at the top two cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the other on the bottom of your library. So yeah even better than scry 2 because you look at two cards and then you just You'd keep take one. one into your hand yeah. yeah um and the seagate we like the idea of these people being close to the water because Miletus is on the shore sort of so that that also helped out uh making sure that you know having our characters in the story of metamai were also by the ocean uh we also had riddle keeper and riddle smith and these are cards that aren't necessarily that great riddle keeper is a um a homunculus uh, whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control that creature's controller puts the top two cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard so not a very powerful card um but flavor wise it's great fools surrender their sandy to his riddles even greater fools try to solve them so. yeah so it could be talking about metamai even uh the riddle smith is one in a blue for a two one artificer human whenever you cast an artifact spell you may draw a card if you do discard a card yeah. Funny thing is, you don't have a lot of artifacts in the deck, but doesn't matter because it's doesn't the Riddle Smith. He's the Riddle Smith. Yeah. yeah. If we were trying to build an artifact deck, and sure he'd go in there, but again, like we were more about the idea of his what he does. Uh, that fact, the fact that he, you know, Metamai. The other thing is like he doesn't just go to Miletus. He goes everywhere. He is right. ageless. He can go wherever the heck he wants. He can probably planeswalk. Who knows? Um, I don't think he officially has a spark. Not yet. Maybe Wink. someday. Yeah, I mean, that'd be sweet. I would totally play that card. <laughs> <Have this> card. <laughs> Take extra turns. Oh my gosh. Yes, please. <laughs> if there's anything like Ralph Zarek, I'm all in. Um, so uh, the next next section is one of my favorites. It's giving opponents choices. Um, now, if this was to be a, a thousand percent flavorful, every time you gave an opponent a choice, it should be able to like directly benefit them. But cards and magic aren't necessarily built that way. Uh, you can't, you know, if, if that was the case, then this deck would not be very powerful because every time you gave someone the choice, they could just actively screw you over, you know what I mean? Right. And there are some cards that have things that are similar to this, um, but the, the, the card that really uh, sort of headed off this whole ke- section was Factor Fiction. And I don't know if you guys have played Factor Fiction before, but... Yeah, it's a very good card. I'm sure a lot it of people is have. a very good card. Uh, so Fact or Fiction is a instant for three in the blue reveal the top five cards of your library an opponent separates those cards into two piles put one into your hand and the other into your graveyard um so it's great it's it draws you a ton of cards sometimes uh but it also forces someone to 
make a choice and they're like choosing their future yeah exactly and they have to you get to choose which one you eventually take but they're the one that the ones that have to separate the piles and there's usually a correct way of separating them so that you know you'll do like four lands and then one spell or something so that you don't just get mitigating a sweet deal. It. Yeah. yeah you could also just do all five cards in one pile and zero in the next which all which is an option which is crazy um but you are making the choice and you can totally mess up I've messed up on Factor Fictions before, and it really punishes you because you put the wrong cards in the same pile, and the person's like, I'm definitely taking that one. Right. Well, it's also the kind of card where we've seen this happen where you do it to your ally in the game, and they just give you all five cards. Yeah, and that's super intense. Actually, this is something that I think is great in EDH. I I really like Factor Fiction because yeah. it also gives a reason for someone else to swing at someone else if they like do something they're like oh why'd you do that like oh swing at you (laughs) and you're still the i drew three cards right right exactly i drew the cards but that person got hit for giving them all to me yeah uh this next one's you know i haven't played with this card but this card is actually very good it's um four mana for an artifact it's called thrawn tome you pay five and tap the thrawn tome reveal the top three cards of your library target opponent chooses one of those cards you put that card into the graveyard, and then you draw two cards. So they choose which card you don't, don't get, get of the three. Which is great. You're always Five getting Five mana two. draw two, just like repeatable, is pretty great. Yeah, and you always get two, which is nice. Um, Thrantome is cool, too, because it has the the tome idea. Like, I love the uh, every line holds a tail in between, lie a thousand more. Um, <laughs> Weather... Again, it's giving your opponent's choices. Yeah, it actually looks exactly like the Weatherlight symbol, which is the expansion it's from, which is kind of cool, too. Uh, now, this next one did a lot of work in the game, and this is totally a Josh Lee Kwai card. It's Crystal Shard. I love this card. Three-drop artifact. Uh, you can pay three and tap it, or just blue and tap it. Return target creature to its owner's hand unless its controller pays one. So it's like one mana. Of course, anyone can do that, but it's like, no, you do this to your own creatures if you need to save them for one. Yeah, and you just choose not to pay it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's Is it exactly Erratic Portal? Which is a. It's a, very similar to Erratic Portal. Yeah. It, it gives you the option of paying colorless for it, which is nice. Um, right. I mean, the effect is, I think, the exact same. Maybe yeah, it is. The it's cost the exact is same. slightly different. But yeah, and then you can catch them with their pants down, where th- basically, if they. Ever tap out. Ever tap out, you just unsummon a creature for free. Yeah. Uh, super powerful effect. But then what you guys were doing, we'll talk about in a little bit, but it actually can go infinite with a uh, mnemonic wall. Yeah. And, and a. Um, <laughs> And yep. a uh, and a what what's it called a extra turn effect extra turn effect in that and then Mike Wall yeah things were going pretty nutty uh, <laughs> basically yeah that happens um, yep uh, we had intuition in there which is a card I've always wanted to play in commander but never have really had the correct deck to do it with which is two in the blue for an instant you can search your library for three cards and reveal them target the opponent chooses one you put that into your hand and the rest into your graveyard so this is great if you want to purposely throw stuff into the yard and decks that have like Genesis or anger or any of those cards that right. graveyard matters cards. Um, great thing about flavor decks is you're allowed to play a bunch of cards where they would be on the fringe normally but they are actually like you know they're like well this is a playable card i that i actually can like make an excuse to put in this deck yeah exactly yeah which was great that was definitely like anytime we found one of those cards we were like yes perfect (laughs) Perfect. this is one i've never seen it's called evangelize oh yeah it's four and a white it has buyback two and a white so if you pay the two and a white in addition to the four and a white, then you get the spell back into your hand after it resolves. Um, it says gain control of target creature of an opponent's choice that he or she controls. So this is, I don't remember, know if you remember the old card from the dark called Preacher, mm-hmm. which basically you tap the Preacher, but then they got to choose which of your their creatures you got control of. But this is Preacher basically on a spell. Pretty interesting. Very interesting. Um, we like that too because it's like they could give you you're their worst creature, or if you're in the right situation, you bounce their thing with Crystal Shard. They only have one thing to give you. They have, they to, have give to give that it to you. To you. Yeah. yeah, no, that's pretty awesome. And with buyback, it's repeatable. And again, you're giving them the choice, or at least the illusion of choice. Yeah, this is actually a decent card. Yeah, the fact that you can buy it back is really cool. Um, against oh my gosh, against a freaking Voltron deck that only has one creature out there, this card's a house. And yeah, it's crazy. It is tart. Wait, is the Gain control of target creature of an opponent's choice here because you control. So it does still target. It does still target. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. It, because I think they have to target it before they give it to you. Yeah, it's just weird. They're targeting your spell. But yeah. I guess otherwise it would get around hexproof, which it doesn't, unfortunately, because that would be pretty sweet. That would be pretty sweet. Uh, fight or flight is the last in the sort of give your opponent's choices. Uh, <laughs> 
This card's ridiculous. Three and a white. Uh, it's an enchantment at the beginning of combat on each opponent's turn. Separate all creatures that player controls into two piles. Only creatures in the pile of his or her choice can attack this turn. Yeah, it's um. There used to be a few cards like this. There was like Raging River or something where you'd have to put your creatures on opposite sides of the river and only one side could do stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. This is like something they played with for a while. This is an interesting card. Just again, they have to choose which creatures of yours can attack them, basically. Yeah, but it gives them the choice, and it can be good, I guess. Actually, the card's pretty weak. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something's still attacking no matter what. Yeah, it's hard for you to make plays that make it good, but it once in a while could maybe, I don't even know, whatever. Yeah. Um, oh, this next card. This is the card where... This card's actually deceptively good. I think it's playable. This card's insanely good, especially yeah. in 1v1 when you only have to deal with one person's deck. Especially when you have something that gains you 40 life, which you guys happen to have. Actually, you know, this is, this would be good in multiplayer too because, well, I'll have you read it. This guy. Yeah, because you don't have to... You're not the only one that would pay, yeah, but it can right. work against you too. So it's Zer's Weirding. It's three and a blue for an enchantment. It says players play with their hands revealed. So everybody's hands are available to be seen by everybody else. Yeah, which is really important for Metamai. He should have perfect knowledge at right. all times. Uh, if a player would draw a card, he or she reveals it instead. So instead of drawing a card, you just show it to the table. Mm -hmm. And then any player may pay two life. If a player does, you put that card into its owner's graveyard so they don't draw it. Otherwise, yeah. if no one pays the two life, they draw the card. So... You can basically make Stop it so them. no one draws cards yeah. uh, anymore if you're just willing to pay the life. This was the card that during the game, it felt like Yul didn't... Uh, my guess at the time was like, he doesn't know what that card does and he doesn't want to read it. Yeah. <laughs> because he had 80 life. And literally, if he just played this, he could just completely be like, you've got three cards in your hand. Those are the only cards you have for the rest of the game. Yeah, because every time you're going to draw a card, I'm just going to force you to discard it. Yep. Um, in the multiplayer game, this is crazy because... Let's say if you're at low life, but someone else isn't, and, and someone else draws a card, the person can be like, "Oh, I I don't want him to have that." Yep. So and everyone's just... gonna have a reason to to bin a card. It'll probably be a lot of negotiation. Well, will you pay the two life? No. Why don't you pay it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Yeah. This this card is a little bit crazy. I've seen it on the table only a couple times, but in in the game specifically, you guys played. It was extremely powerful because of the amount of life that he had gained. Yeah, and also at some point we wrecked all of the person's lands, so we could so shoot. You, you just... could just say like you're never drawing a land again. You can draw yeah. everything else in your deck, but you're never going to get a land again. Yeah. Um, we had two cards in there: Dichotomancy and Mimeofacture. Uh, these cards are not good um, <laughs> in in uh, in EDH um, because what it is is they they're essentially cards that let you look through an opponent's deck. Um, we put them in there because Metamai has perfect knowledge, and we didn't want something that was super busted. But these cards in general, it's like go through the deck and find a permanent and get rid of it. They're not that powerful anyway because the chance of them drawing that card are just so low. And I'm sure, they may tutor for it. But in general, this card's just not that great. Um, and so we wanted to put these in there just so that we could see everything in their card, in their library and mm -hmm. be able to search through it. And then that was it. Just and the it idea. was on flavor. It was on flavor, yeah. It was just the idea of getting perfect information. The next one is a really good card. It's called Future Sight. It's two and three blue for an enchantment. It says, play with the top card of your library revealed. You may play the top card of your library. It's kind of like Oracle of Moldiah on steroids. Yeah. Um, this is a, it's more powerful than it looks because what happens is you look at the top card of your library because you basically play with it face up. Let's say it's a land. You play it. Then you flip the next card up. If you can cast that, you cast it. Then you flip the next card up. So yeah. it's not just like, I think some people think of it as like one extra card per turn. It's no, not. It could, it could be, be a, it could be 10. Yeah. Because as long as you can play that top card of your library, then it you then you get to look at the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. Yeah. Um yeah, super powerful, very very strong card. Yeah, I think people are a little afraid of stuff that says show this like reveal that card because it's like, "Oh, then they know I have it." It's like, "Well, you know, you get a lot of extra benefit too if you can play that card, you know, if you it's coming tons. off the top from like a Corsair of Crufix or uh, an Oracle of Moldiah or whatever, and Future Sight is sweet. It's totally... it. That, I think, is the most on flavor of the Total Knowledge cards. Yeah. Future Sight. It's and literally what Metamite maybe has. Maybe the most powerful. Yeah. Um, so we um, we knew that this deck needed to be able to go infinite. It's <laughs> sad, but it's true that if you didn't put it in there, then it would be a flavor fail because the Metamite would not be ageless. Right. Uh, so we had to have at least a couple of ways to go infinite, um, but we didn't want to make them super easy. So... <laughs> The main way of doing it that we did in the game is Mnemonic Wall and Crystal Shard and then an extra turn card. What Mnemonic Wall, Mnemonic Wall does, if you don't know, is when it enters the battlefield, you can take an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard, put it into your hand. 
Yeah. So like the an crystal, extra turn card. <laughs> yep. So the crystal shard bounces the mnemonic wall back to your hand. You play it. You get a, a card, a sorcery that gives you an extra turn back to your hand. You play that. It goes to the graveyard. On your extra turn, you bounce the mnemonic wall. Play it. Get the extra turn card back. Yeah. Play the extra turn card. Now we're just in an infinite loop of infinite turns. Yeah. The only problem is that requires eleven mana essentially yeah. to do, uh, and so it's really hard to go infinite and make use of your mana because you need to make sure they allocate enough to recast the mnemonic wall and the extra turn card. As as soon as you get to eleven mana, though, you do it, and you can just keep doing it, and and then you play your lands for turn. Yeah. The other player's not going at all, so. The only thing that really hung you guys up is the fact that in uh, Magic Online, which is where you're playing it, that actually takes a lot of your clock. Yeah, because in a regular game, you could just be like, all right, I've demonstrated the loop. I'm just going to start drawing cards and playing and taking, be like, turn one, you draw a card. It's a land you get to play. Turn two, you know. And yeah, you don't have to retap, put everything in your graveyard, draw it back out. You just yeah. go, you know, yeah, exactly. But you'd have to do that on Modo, and that definitely uh, got a little, little crazy towards it, the end there. Yeah, it, it, it. That is a uh, infinite turn lock, though. That is hard to beat. Yes, very hard to beat. Because uh, if no one's holding up a counter spell, they don't really have any way of interacting with it. Um, and we also had Tamil, the Moon Sage, who was one of the two planeswalkers in the deck, and she also is someone that trans transgresses time itself. And her, she was there because her ultimate is: uh, you get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size, and whenever a card is put into your graveyard from anywhere, you may return it to your hand. So she essentially does what the mnemonic wall is doing. Every time you cast an extra turn card, you just get back to your but hand. For and way cast it cheaper. Again. Yeah, yeah, way cheaper for yeah. free, essentially. I mean, you have to cast the the extra turn card, yeah. but you don't have to actually bounce your mnemonic wall and cast it again. So you save six mana on the exchange. Yeah. yeah. Um, that didn't actually happen, but the crystal shard. Oh, no, it did. Oh, the Tamiel thing yeah, happened? Yeah, the Tamiel ult happened as well as oh, the mnemonic yeah, yeah, wall yeah, thing yeah, happened. Yeah. Once because... the Tamiel ult happened, it was. Yeah, that's when we, we knew we could lock it out. Yeah. And make it a very uninteractive game for our opponent the whole game unfortunately yeah robert that, didn't get to do a whole lot he did not i mean the thing is like the game they don't so the judges don't uh, judge your flavor based on how the game goes so right. it meant that you'll was like i'm just gonna start taking infinite turns yeah just start winning yeah just start winning at any cost listen um, everybody who plays on mtgo is thanking you for that because we wanted our free stuff yeah that's right we didn't want no drown in sorrow yeah that's right um, and so we had the finally we had the fun flavor cards. So these cards are not necessarily good, but they're just there purely for flavor. This first one's good. This first one's great, actually. It's one of your pet cards. Yeah, it's one of my favorite cards in EDH. Um, it's Swan Song. I've Hooray. talked about it a million times. We'll talk about it again. It's a one mana counter spell, but it can only counter an instant sorcery or enchantment, and then it gives a two two flyer to the opponent that you've countered their thing. Um, Cost, and the flavor cost one text. blue. And the flavor text, why don't you read it? Is Metamai the Ageless saying, The most enlightened mages create beauty from violence. So Metamai was on the flavor text. The card itself is really powerful. It was an auto include, and uh, the judges loved it. And it's actually an awesome card. Yeah. The judges loved it, Josh. It was there was a point specifically made about like I'm so glad you put Swan Song in there, and I was like, Yes. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> Thank you, Josh Lee Kwai. Because I talk about that card all the time. And by the way, if you're running blue decks and you don't have Swan Song in there, what are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because here's the thing. Okay, sure, you can't counter a creature, but sometimes that enchantment comes down and wins the game. So rarely, and there are occasions, don't get me wrong, but very often it is a, a sorcery or an instant that basically either ices the game yeah. or wins it. Yep. So either it makes it so you can't win or it wins. And also, so often it's a counter spell that stops you from winning. Mm -hmm. So Swan Song allows you to cast your main spell, but still hold up that one mana to protect it. Yeah. Uh, we also had the Miletus Charlatan, two in the blue for a human wizard. And this card's actually pretty sweet, too. Two in the blue, tap it. The controller of target instant or sorcery spell copies it. That player may choose new targets for the copy. So you just double up all your stuff. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know, extra time. Turns. Extra turns, yeah, yeah, time, yeah. And it's Miletus. He's a charlatan. He's totally in line with the flavor and a good card. And then we had the Traveling Philosopher. Who this is, is just, great, actually. He's just literally a 2-2 two, two for two, but entirely is entirely about um, just flavor because it's one of the, like, the 12 oracles or something yeah traveling philosophers are always trying to break the riddles of the sphinxes we know this yeah exactly um so that's pretty much the deck uh there's some crazy bad things in there like the guardians of Miletus, which is just a wall <laughs> <laughs> it's just a 06 wall it's just no six wall just hanging out we definitely played it in the game too which is hilarious no i think we actually chucked it from our hand because it was no need for it at some point right <laughs> um 
the big question is like if you guys want to build this deck i would say go for it this deck was a lot of fun to play uh it looked like it was a blast there's a lot of actual interactivity and it is fragile but the commander is powerful um it gets the job done things that you would do to make this deck better for multiplayer just cut all the flavor so how dare you i mean i'm just spitting truth over here <laughs> just spitting truth um yeah i mean this can be a very strong deck anything that's taking extra turns is going to be a strong deck and yeah and metamite just does that by just swinging it's also going to be the kind of deck that as soon as you do that once you're going to get gunned down because people don't like to sit there while you take a bunch of turns yeah, so yeah it's very not fun to play against when someone goes infinite so what's going to happen with a deck like that i think is that people are going to gang up on you just even though somebody else is playing narset or something at least when narset kills you it's fairly fast yeah well the nice thing is that you can just be like no no it's a flavor only deck and then show people like look i'm not going to take an extra turn right now you can <laughs> like my guy can't even attack meta Mike can't even attack oh yeah that was an interesting thing that happened which is you're taking infinite turns but on all those turns meta Mike can't attack yeah cuz meta Mike doesn't say he can't attack on the extra turns he creates it's mm -hmm. just any extra turns yeah which was crazy uh at the end of the game, we had like 50 seconds left, and Robert was at 21 life, and we had like some two twos on the board, and Men and I couldn't attack. So what we had to do is Yol had to let him have a turn, and then Yol would take his turn and swing, right? Um, and then <laughs> let him have a turn, and so it, he was attacking with Men and I still every other turn, but it wasn't just like we're going in the infinite loop because having the Men and I in the air was actually really good because he had more damage than just a two two. Well, yeah, that that was pretty funny. I actually with. One minute left. I didn't think you guys had enough time to win. Me neither. I, I was like, crap. We're ugh, I'm going to get crucified. Gonna lose to the clock. We're going to lose to the clock in a deck that's taking extra turns. Like Everyone's going to hate me. Like, okay, we, so, we are monsters. <laughs> so we're talking about the game. Where you can watch it is you can go to twitch.tv slash magic. Yep. And under past broadcasts, you'll see the Community Cup. I think it is a highlighted match, but even if, if it's not there, you can just look on the Community Cup day two. Yep. And it's the first... Well, the, the Iron Root Chef is the first event of day two. Mm -hmm. and um, You can watch us build the deck, and you can watch the commentators talk about it, too. Because Marshall actually says, I want someone to build Metamai, which was awesome. Yeah, which you built. Yeah. And then he kind of got, got all over you for putting in a bunch of extra turns. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he didn't see the rest of the deck list, I guess. Uh, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> I think he saw the whole thing. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's really fun to watch, and you can watch... Uh, Jimmy's speech to the judges and watch the That's judges' right. reaction. The, the the fence of the of the deck and the story it told. Um, uh, and you can watch. Uh, you can just keep watching and watch everybody draft battle for Zendikar. Yeah, it's pretty cool. By the time this podcast comes out, people will have drafted it then. Yeah, that's true. Release weekend will have just happened. For us, pre-release weekend just happened. We should talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we definitely should. Um, so yeah, it's uh, we'll also include the links, of course, to both Days of the Community Cup and the highlight of the match in the more info box, the show notes. All that good stuff. All right. I know people are excited to see if they won stuff, so let's announce the winners. Contest winners. I forgot about Bing. I always yeah. forgot about Bing. Yeah, well, Google's way better. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> uh we have winners from three different areas, from YouTube comments, from our email address, and from Twitter. So what we do is I, I uh, enter in everyone's name just in the numerical list and then go to a number generator and just hit generate uh, six different times. No, f oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different times this time. Jeez, we're giving away a lot of stuff. Yeah, we have a lot of those intro intro packs. Um, and so oh, we're remember, gonna... let's uh, the contest was we asked what card or cards from battle for zendikar you're most right. excited about what decks are going into what combos that you want to pull off or synergies uh yeah. so we're going to read people's answers all right so, so if you hear your name you won something you will need to email us oh, yeah. your mailing address you have to email it to commandcast at rocketjump.com if we don't get your mailing address we cannot send you your stuff. Well, in that case, I just get to crack it myself, right? I get to open it myself. <laughs> send it in soon because Jimmy in. likes to crack. Yeah, I like to crack packs, man. <laughs> no, I'm going with that. All right. Anyway, moving on. Our first contest winner is from YouTube. Uh, his, her name, not sure. Azza Tylee. Make sure you email us. And uh, here she says, the white and green retreats have a nice home in my Karametra deck. Triggering it five or six times per turn is nice. Well, that seems like it would be good. That is nice. Yeah, Karametra, if you guys don't know, is a god uh, from the Theros block that lets you uh, cheat in some lands. Very powerful. Um, the next one is Oscar Robalino. Says, Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger, Conduit of Ruin, Desolation Twin, Void Winner. Wow, that's uh, ambitious. 
A lot of them. All of these are going in my Joyra deck. Bleh. Smothering Abomination is going in the Tasa deck. Oh, yeah, Joyra is getting some upgrades for me too. Jura Thank you for the tips, Oscar. Definitely getting some upgrades. Yeah, and uh, the uh, the Tasa deck, the Smothering Abomination is a sweet draw outlet. That's a four to three Devoid Flyer. Yep. And anytime you sacrifice a creature, draw a card. Draw a card yeah. And uh, the Tasa deck. You do that also he's have to sack about. a creature every. Right. Up, yeah. Uh, the Tasa deck he's talking about is the one that you can sack three creatures and I believe just exile something, which is pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Tasa Orzhov Sion. Okay, uh, the next is people that emailed us. Yes. First up, Owen Fisher. My favorite card from Battle for Zendikar is definitely Amiria Shepherd. I especially love the combo with Amiria Shepherd, Earthcraft, Perilous Forays to get all the planes in your deck out. Yep. That's right. Also so, with Sakura Tribe Elder, you can do this. Um, yeah, which is crazy. The combos that I mean, it's a seven mana card, so you're not gonna really see it in standard anytime. Uh, but Perilous Forays is like a three uh, green green enchantment. You can tap one to sacrifice a creature, search your library for your land card with a basic land type and put into the play tapped. Then shuffle your library. So every time you sack a creature with uh, her, you get to essentially drop one of the things in your library or a graveyard onto the battlefield. Which is um, super intense. Omnath also, good. by the way, uh, I think goes infinite with Perilous Forays out. Because every time you sacrifice a land, it deals damage, and then you get to play a land, and then he makes a token, and you and can you sacrifice sac that creature. To do damage. Although, does the land come in tapped? He doesn't go infinite, but he you can do a you can mow down a board. All I know is Perilous person. Forays is awesome a lot of the time. It's an underplayed yeah. card. You should try it out. Uh, the next one is Perseus Johnson. The card that I'm looking forward to for commander is Munda Ambush Leader. Finally, my ally EDH deck has a commander that allows me to constantly draw into allies. I also am liking Gideon and Ally Encampment. So oh, that's cool. Looks like Perseus is going to do an Ally deck. That's that seems cool. Yeah, and it's sweet because every uh, Mundo just essentially assures that you draw a uh, an Ally in an Ally every single turn, pretty much. And in Red White, it's one of the things that Red White is missing, and we always talk about, and we always get yelled at because I know people do like Red White, but I still consider it the weakest of the color combinations. Yeah, uh, because card draw and mana ramp, and this covers card draw, so that's good. Very Halfway nice. there. Yeah, we got there. We're getting there uh brandon rains over email said my wife and i just started playing edh and we're both really getting into it i am running mono red yay uh th though mostly it's artifacts toretti is my commander and my wife is playing a voltron but not really voltron -y deck with derivy we are both really excited about all the full art lands in the new fat packs and the big huge colors creatures nice. yeah that's right nice. we had I'm a couple people point out the uh, the amazing full art lands and that are, i mean those are auto includes in every deck right they they better be yeah, the bear I gotta buy like twenty fat packs for all my decks. It's gonna like because I need a lot of lands. You do need a lot of lands. That's gonna be expensive, but yeah. it's gonna look sweet. It's gonna look super sweet. Um, all right, from Twitter we have at Dune Echo says the combo I want to pull off the most is Anafens of the Foremost with Void Attendant, Sprout Spor Sprout Swarm with Free Buyback has to be good. Sprout Swarm is a great card. Um, what is Void Attendant? <laughs> void Attendant is a uh, he's a devoid creature that for one in green you can put a card from an opponent's uh, graveyard or exile into the graveyard and you get a one one scion. Oh, uh, so you put it so. from exile into the graveyard. If Anafenza puts it back into exile, yes, because if it would go into the graveyard from anywhere, it gets exiled. Oh, yeah, Anafenza with cool, uh, right? the with the ingest and processing stuff seems really good yeah my inoffensive token deck is definitely going to get changed some around processors a lot. yeah it's going to get some processors because i usually never play inoffensive now i actually have a reason to do it which is awesome that's that's annoying actually yeah it's super annoying <laughs> and finally our last winner from twitter at pearl diver 19 i'm looking forward to part the water veil in my narset and ruinous path in my terial so part of the water veil is the new uh take an extra turn card and uh ruinous path uh, in Terial, if you guys don't know what Terial is, Terial just came out in the From the Vault, actually. But Ruinous Path is the Awaken uh, Sorcery Speed um, uh, kill a creature or a Planeswalker. Oh, and then turn one of your lands into a dude? Yeah. Nice. So pretty cool. I don't know the names of all these cards yet. You've played uh, B4Z a lot more than I have. B4Z. I like that. <laughs> B does come before Z, so yeah, that's very... Yeah, it's not a lie. correct it more, <laughs> more than one way. It's not A to Z, it's B4Z. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right congratulations guys if you won the contest make sure you email us your mailing address commandcast at rocketjump.com and we will try to get those things out to you as soon as possible but uh if i don't get it to you as soon as possible that means i'm lazy or i'm busy and i'm sorry but they're coming <laughs> i swear to god no one has ever not gotten a prize from the show i'll say that much that well every once in a while something happens and the the emails go hey where's the prize and we'll be like you know oh like we got the wrong address or something, and then we send it out. So I've if you had don't... things bounce back from France and stuff, 
and it's like it goes to a different address sometimes. I'm just like, oh god, I have to send another one out. But you will get your prizes. Just be in contact with us. Yeah, Give us I'm your a, address. I'm a one man shipping army over here. All right, time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Jimmy, you have something cool. That's right. All chat, baby. Uh, I'm hosting a new show. Not a new show. I'm hosting a show for League of Legends. It's the community based show. Hey, more community stuff called All Chat. Uh, they cover all sorts of cool things. It's me, Josh Kim, and James Patterson. You may know him as Riot Dash. He does a lot of the shoutcasting and announcing for coverage whenever they do like Worlds or LCS. Those guys also cool play stuff. Magic. They all do play Magic. Uh, Josh Kim just started playing Magic. Uh, Played some EDH with him EDH. the other night. Yep. Yeah. Now we have two Joshes. Hooked him. Hooked him. We did hook him. Uh, he built, uh, actually, one of my first decks. He built Helleva. Yep. Helleva. Jelleva. Jello. Uh, so the show comes out. It's already come out. The first episode was last Friday. Very exciting. Um, what is the show? I know it's about League of Legends, but how does it work? So we cover, uh, it's basically a, like a talk show kind of where we cover a lot of community based art. So if someone like has created new, awesome fan art for the, for the game, uh, we cover like a few things, talk about it a little bit. We also do a thing called BM Rajiji, like bad manners or good game. Mm, where we gotcha. talk about is something bad or good. So for instance, is being a tryhard a bad or a good thing? Gotcha. And it's great because that actually applies to not just League, but also stuff like Magic or any competitive just anything. gaming. Yeah, gaming in general, which is cool. So, so you get sort of roundtable discussions in there too? Yeah, it's a lot of like us talking to each other. Like, do you agree, disagree? Lots of laughs. Um, it's sweet. It's kind of, uh, I will say this, the Command Zone has prepared me very well. <laughs> just for, to talk a lot. Just to talk a lot. It's great. I have a lot to attribute to doing this show, <laughs> and I don't want to stop doing it ever because I feel like I've just made been a better conversationalist because of it. Where do we find the show, Jimmy? All you have to do is go to YouTube.com and look up the words all chat, and it should be the first thing that pops up. It's in a channel called The League Community. So they have like about 40 videos on there, and there's there's also a lot of funny videos of like flash animations that people have made and stuff. It's really great. It's all there. And plus, League of Legends is freaking awesome. Yeah, it's the biggest game in the world. It's really yep, exciting. Biggest video um, game in the world. Magic's the biggest card game in the world. And a lot of the Riot people, not just the people on all chat, but a lot of our friends work at Riot, yeah. play Magic, in fact we've drafted with like one of the ceos of riot <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right so there's just they're totally into magic they're all game designers tons of cool stuff uh, yeah. if you haven't checked out league of legends definitely i mean if you haven't checked out league of legends then something's wrong something's wrong yeah um shout out of course to andy belford patrick scarborough and everyone else that we draft and play with over there what's up wesley wesley what's uh, all right, I have, um, I'm also going to do an end step because we're only doing one episode. Oh my gosh, uh, this is a this first. Week. So we're doing two end steps. Um, Narcos, have you watched this show? No, I've seen the posters for it everywhere. It's on, on Netflix, Netflix, right? Netflix, there's a show called Narcos. It's about Pablo Escobar and the sort of early days of the drug trade and the drug war. Ah, and it's very nice. an awesome show. Um, I'm totally hooked on it. Just started. Who's Pablo Escobar for those that do not know? Pablo Escobar was a Colombian drug lord um, who also was at one point like a congressman and also sort of a revolutionary, sort of the Colombian Robin Hood, mm -hmm. if you will. At one time, one of, if not the richest men in the world. Uh, we're talking worth like, you know, tens of billions of dollars in the 80s. Yeah. Super, super, super rich and powerful. But it also he and his cartel and his group sort of revolutionized the way that the drug trade really worked in the world. Wow. So super interesting. It's about a DE agent from the U.S. It's about Pablo Escobar. It's about a lot of other characters. It is rated R, so, you know, sorry, Jack Landis. You're probably not ready for that yet. <laughs> but definitely a very cool show. He's like, show. I play with demons, bro. I'm <laughs> sacrificing creatures. What's rated R about my card game that I can't race in real life? <laughs> uh, Narcos, check it out on yeah. Netflix. Wagner Mora plays... Uh... Pablo. Uh, Pablo, yeah. And he's and also the, he was also in Elysium, if you don't if you remember. The guy that plays Pablo is really, really good. In fact, the whole cast is pretty good, but the Pablo guy is is super good. And sweet. The guy that played um Oberyn Martell in Game of Thrones oh. uh is also one of the main characters. Pedro so. Pedro. Pedro. That's awesome. Um Netflix is killing it, man. Netflix is killing it. Gosh, they're killing it. Yeah. If, also, if you don't have Netflix, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. are you doing with your life? They're bringing back Black Mirror for a few episodes too and stuff. It's great. They're doing cool stuff. Yeah. Um, oh no it's not just black mirror they're bringing back mr show oh really i didn't yeah, hear that for a four episode run wow very exciting if you guys like david cross uh what's like the uh, one of the og yeah. comedy yeah. shows back in the so day funny. um 
All right, make sure you check out the Masters of Modern podcast. Alex Kessler, Ben Bateman, talk about modern and all things competitive magic. You can follow them on Twitter at the MMMcast, or you can find their podcast at rocketjump.com slash the MMcast. Yeah, they're right next to us in the podcast tab of Rocket Jump. Our editor for the show is <gasps> Terry Robertson. Hey, and, Terry. Hey, Terry. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the Living Cards animations. You can find them at Living Cards MTG. Make sure you guys check out the videos on our channel. They're really cool. I'll have all sorts of sweet animations. Plus, you can check out Terry's first video that he ever cut together and yeah. you can give him a shout out and tell him he's doing a good job. Unless he doesn't, then don't say anything. <laughs> Terry, why didn't you do a good job? Terry? I'm sure you'll do fine, Terry. All right, everybody. <laughs> thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>